This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Turkey's presidential election appears to be headed to a runoff in two weeks. Preliminary results show Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan received 49.4 percent of the vote. His main challenger, Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, received just under 45 percent. The two candidates will likely face each other in a second round of voting on May 28. Klitschdorolu campaigned on a vow to end what he called Erdogan's authoritarian rule. Erdogan has been in power for 20 years, first as prime minister, then as president. On Sunday, Erdogan spoke to a crowd outside the AK party headquarters in Ankara. If the decision of our nation shows that the elections have been completed, then there is no problem. Elections for the lawmakers of the Grand National Assembly of Turkey resulted in our people's alliance winning the majority. Currently, the majority in the parliament is in our people's alliance. Our alliance dominates almost all commissions. Therefore, we do not doubt that the choice of our nation, which gave the majority in the parliament to our alliance, will be in favor of trust and stability in the presidential election. Earlier today, Erdogan's challenger, Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, said he would prevail in the runoff. Despite all his smear campaigns and insults, Erdogan did not get the result he expected. Nobody should get excited, but a fate accompli. Elections are not won on the balcony. Election data still continues to come in. If our nation decides on a runoff, with our pleasure, we'll definitely win this election in the second round. Everyone will see it. For more, we go to Istanbul, Turkey, where we're joined by Kaya Genç, an award-winning Turkish essayist and historian. He's the author of several books, including most recently The Lion and the Nightingale, A Journey Through Modern Turkey. He's covered the Turkish elections for the London Review of Books. His recent article for The Nation is headlined The Political Aftershock of Turkey's Devastating Earthquake. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Kaya Gench. Uh, can you start off by talking about the significance of this runoff and that it is likely going to a runoff on May 28th? This was a total shock, because we were expecting a clear opposition victory. Uh, all the polls were pointing to that direction. And so we were preparing to write the political obituary of Recep Tayyip Erdogan, Turkey's president for two decades. But Erdogan made a stunning comeback, and that was a total blow for people uh, in Istanbul. Istanbul voted uh, predominantly for the opposition, but when you look at the whole country, the whole ballots opened, now it seems like we have been mistaken in the polls. And uh, Erdogan has a five-point lead, and the third uh, candidate in the presidential uh, race is also a right-wing figure whose supporters are more likely to support Erdogan. So if he gets that 5 percent as well, it will be an easy, comfortable win for Erdogan uh, for the next elections. But this was a total shock for the Turkish establishment, because for months Erdogan was never speaking optimistically about the election results. He was his usual self, bombastic rhetoric, muscular nationalism. But he never said, we are going to win definitely. This is what the opposition said. The opposition was very certain that this was the end of Erdogan, that we were getting rid of him in the first round. And so yesterday, there was huge disappointment. And the supporters of the opposition felt a little bit betrayed, because after hours, when the first results came, the opposition leaders were nowhere to be seen. They made very brief appearances during the night, but very brief appearances that gave no hope to the voters whatsoever. So this morning, we woke up to a very frustrated city. People feel betrayed and fooled by, by the pollsters. Uh, and I don't know if the opposition will gather enough energy to prepare for the runoff in two weeks.
So tell us about uh, who the opposition leader is, Kamal Klitschdorolu. Talk about the he, he himself and also the movement that came together to try to defeat Erdogan. Sure. So Kemal Kulishtarolu is an Alevi, um, a short, well-mannered, softly spoken Alevi, a grandfatherly figure who is the anti-Erdogan. He speaks in a very civilized way, he never gets angry, he's very calculating, and he seems a very civilized man. So, and he's the leader of the CHP, the Republican People's Party, which is of course the founder of modern Turkey a century-long party, a century-old party. And so Kılıçdaroğlu played the role of a mediator, a middleman. And he said, we're going to change the direction of the CHP. We're going to make peace with the religious people. We're going to make peace with the Kurds. We're going to get the support of the nationalists. We are going to be the center piece of the anti-Erdogan movement. And that he did very diligently and for months. So he, he went to, into meetings, he convinced uh, five other opposition parties to form an alliance, and he called it the, the National Alliance. And then he also, support, he also received the support of the Kurds and the far left and the environmentalists. So 13 parties in total supported his bid. So, at the one hand, we have these 13 parties and Kılıçdaroğlu as their candidates, always saying the right things, culturally, politically, saying nothing politically uh, incorrect. And then we had Erdogan and his coalition, which, is, which was a far-right coalition. And we have to be honest, the winner of yesterday's uh, vote was the far-right in Turkey. And so these are different shades of far right. One party um, called Yeniden Refa, which is a very religious party. Another one, a Kurdish religious party. So we thought that Kılıçdaroğlu, a Biden-like figure, white-haired, a bit boring, but a peacemaker, would steal the vote from the extremities of Turkish politics. But we were very badly mistaken. This was a huge win for the for the uh, extreme move, extremist movements. And uh, people, when Kılıçdaroğlu, the opposition candidate, uh, announced his bid uh, in March, some people said, this man will never do the job, he, he will not win, because we need someone as tall and angry and um, rebel rousing as Erdogan to beat him. But the opposition party, the CHP, said no, we'll be very calm, this is the man. And now I think the people who opposed Kılıçdaroğlu's candidacy, maybe in two weeks, will say we were proven right. We need someone a bit more like Erdogan to beat Erdogan. So now the opposition unfortunately we'll spend the next few weeks i think debating this issue did we pick the right candidate what could we do right what uh, what did we do wrong of course these will uh, help little to win the second round for them so this will be a frustrating two weeks for the opposition and erdogan now has the full wind of the turkish political system um, in his sales and he made a speech yesterday he made it clear that this was a definite win for him but he fell short of announcing a victory in the first round so he played his cards right uh, three years ago in the mayoral elections in Istanbul the, the lead that the, the candidate that he picked for Istanbul just rushed to the cameras and said we won in the first round and then the opposition candidate, uh, the mayoral candidate for Istanbul won a few hours later. So Erdogan didn't make this mistake. He didn't rush things. 
uh, and he seemed confident that he'll win the elections in the second round. So the problem is, Kalishtaroglu was 100% confident that he would win in the first round, and how will he be able to explain to his voters that he made a miscalculation and that he can win? certainly, clearly, definitely in the second round. Given his authoritarian rule, Erdogan, his enormous power that he's gained over 20 years, do you believe the results of the election? That's number one. And talk about the crisis of the economy in Turkey, not to mention uh, the devastation of the earthquakes in February, and that, how that affected people, and how people in Turkey are feeling right now. Yes. So. Yeah, so these two questions are actually related. Erdogan has a huge control of the Turkish media. So if you look at CNN's Turkish edition, it's 24 hours Erdogan propaganda. If you look at most mainstream channels, 24 hour Erdogan propaganda. So his authoritarian control over the Turkish media. You look at TRT World, for example, you look at all different channels. It's all about Erdogan's rhetoric. And what is Erdogan's rhetoric so far for, for the past two months? It was this. Our, the opposition parties are organized, curated, if you will, by Joe Biden, by the U.S. imperialist system. So he used this very anti-imperialist rhetoric. And he said any vote for the CHP, the founder of the Turkish Republic, was a vote for Joe Biden. So he used this, um, honestly, extra, ex eccentric rhetoric very carefully. And uh, thanks to his authoritarian control over the media, when opposition candidates were attacked with stones during their campaigning in different Anatolian cities, all these TV channels were saying these are self-organized attacks. The opposition parties stoned themselves. This is a whole drama. This is these are all scenarios implemented by Biden, by the Pentagon. And when Turkish TV channels interviewed people on the streets, people were saying exactly the same things. So this was an incredible example of how media could form public opinion in Turkey. And as I've been saying, it's 85, more than 85 percent of Turkish media under Erdogan's control. So they really managed the whole discourse very well. And to the second question, the economic crisis in February 6, when the earthquakes killed more than 50,000 people in Syria and Turkey with a bill of more than 100 billion dollars. Turkey was already in deep trouble. The inflation had soared. The Turkish lira had melted against the dollar for months. And so Turkey was really in a very difficult position. But Erdogan said, uh, using his incredible media dominance, that we are the builders, they are the critics, they are the talkers, we are the builders, and we will use this huge crisis as a great chance to rebuild Turkey. So he started using the rebuild rhetoric and he said, who has built stuff for you throughout the 20th century? The Turkish right-wing parties did. And who is the representative of the Turkish right-wing legacy now? It's me and my coalition partners. Okay, maybe we are a bit far to, far to the right of the equation, but trust us, we are the builders, we'll rebuild those houses, but we will not do that for free. You will have to pay for us. We'll give you credit, uh, which will help you pay for your new houses. And of course, those houses were destroyed because of irregularities in the, in the whole construction system. And Erdogan took no responsibility whatsoever. He said, those buildings are gone drink a glass of cold water and come back to me, vote for me, and let's play this whole game again. And I was listening to lots of supporters of Erdogan in the earthquake hit cities, 11 of them, and people were saying the opposition promises to build housing for us for free, but 
There is no free lunch on Earth. We don't believe them. We, we, we trust Erdogan because in a capitalist system, we will have to pay for this. So it is a very strange um, scenario where the people most violently affected by the earthquake were most passionately supporting the government that was responsible for the toll, I think, and all the experts think like that. But they were saying, we want to do this again, we want new houses, you are the only one who can deliver. So Erdogan's message is, the answer to this crisis, this example of crisis capitalism, will help us rebuild this country, will help and live in the economy. So the, the way out of this crisis is rebuilding these 11 cities. And that's the message he tried to sell, and that's the message he sold much to our dismay. Hi again, I want to thank you so much for being with us, award-winning Turkish essayist and historian, author of several books, including the most recent, The Lion and the Nightingale, A Journey Through Modern Turkey. Uh, he covered the Turkish elections for the London Review of Books, and we'll link to your article in The Nation, The Political Aftershock of Turkey's Devastating Earthquake.